how do we prevent the next pandemic through the One Health approach? And I'd like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to give this talk, albeit this opportunity was given to me a little in cima da hora. Uh, I got the invite on Thursday night because the planned speaker, Dr. Christina Pettenbrewer, was unable to fulfill this uh, compromiso to speak to you today. Uh, this is Dr. Christina here, some details of her career. You can see she's a specialist in One Health. I'm more of an interested observer in One Health who tries to do some research in One Health, and I teach One Health. So I think that's why they called me to stand in for Dr. Christina. So I'm going to stick with her title, uh, and we'll elaborate the talk as we come through. I'll, I'll try to explain to you a little bit about what One Health is. Then we'll look at what One Health has done what's been its actions in the context of the current pandemic, and then what it may or may not be able to do in the case of future pandemics. So can we prevent the next pandemic through the One Health approach? And the short answer would be unlikely. Medium length answer would be that prevention will be difficult, but if applied correctly, this One Health approach may help to significantly reduce the impact of future pandemics. And the full-length answer is what I'm going to present to you now. But my personal answer would be, I hope so. So let's start off with One Health. Why do we, we have this concept of One Health nowadays? If we go back to the 1960s, and we can take this quote by this very famous microbiologist, medic from Australia, who won the Premier Nobel for his uh, work on uh, immuno uh, immune tolerance, uh, Dr. Uh, Sir Frank, McFarland Burnett, and he said that we could think about the middle of the 20th century as being the end of one of the most important revolutions, social revolutions in history, the virtual elimination of infectious diseases as a significant factor in social life. Apparently, something went wrong, because if you look at these data from 2019, you'll see that there are numerous infectious diseases and still causing major health problems around the globe. And today in 2021, we're living a uh, pandemic. So unfortunately, he was wrong. Uh, something else that comes out of these data is that the reason that we're living this change from what Dr. Burnett had predicted is because man's activities on Earth are bringing him more and more into contact with the natural environment. And as a result, we're having more and more interaction with wildlife, and this is resulting in the emergence of more and more diseases that weren't seen at the time of Dr. Burnett. But if we want to justify Dr. Burnett's position, if we go back to the 1960s, we were in this stage here, 1960s with relation to antibiotics, we were in the golden age of antibiotic development. To look at vaccination, vaccination was beginning to have a major impact on majority of the important transmissible diseases, infectious diseases of public health importance at that time. Vaccines were essentially eradicating them. If you look at the way the world was at that moment, in the 1960s, the world had a population of a little over 3 billion. Yeah? Nowadays, we get up to 2020, we're here with almost 8 billion people. Yeah, and if you look at this graph, an interesting point here is that the developed world has stayed more or less stable population-wise over this time frame. And this was probably the population to which Dr. Burnett was referring. If we look at that time, the, 19th, the majority of the population were rural and only one-third of the population was urban. And there's been a direct switch there now. We now have four-sevenths four of the world population living in urban populations and a little less than three billion in rural populations. So there was a demographic change there. We've also changed the way we move around the world. The time that Dr. Burnett spoke, air travel ports, you have all the people every week around the globe. And although it was actually happening, it wasn't as perceived the effects that human activity were having upon biodiversity on this planet. So it's been estimated that since uh, between 1970 and 2014, the populations of 
uh, birds, fish, reptiles, and amphibians on the planet, on average, have declined by 60%. And this impacts upon our oceans and has impacts upon our forests. So these things weren't on Dr. Burnett's radar. Or with this, he had no idea of the size of the industry that exists for illegal wildlife trade, the consumption of wildlife as a component of the diet for many people out of necessity around the globe, and these impacts upon the environment caused by human activity, and the effects they have upon pandemics. So if we want to define One Health, we can use the One Health definition given by the CDC in the States. The One Health is the idea that the health of people is connected to the health of animals and our shared environment, representing the usually simplified image of the three areas, superimposed or, or each one couldn't see with, uh, with each other, and giving this image here. So One Health is a relatively new a relatively old idea. It's an idea that kind of fell out of fashion and came back at the beginning of the 20th century. We have this famous Canadian scientist, Dr. William Osler, Sir William Osler as well, who made this statement here that soap and water and common sense are the best disinfectants. A rather sound advice for the situation we're living in nowadays. Now, he established this field of veterinary pathology as a discipline in an academic discipline in North America, because he was rather unusual insofar as he taught in both medicine and veterinary medicine at two different universities in Montreal. He also published over this relationship between animals and men and he, uh, humans, and he promoted this idea of comparative uh, pathology and the, concept, and the concept of one medicine. In fact, he was the first person to use one medicine as a term in the literature. So modern One Health began really in 2004 with the publishing of the Manhattan Principles, One World, One Health, and you can check these 12 principles which establish the baseline for modern One Health as it stands today. Then in 2018, we dropped the One World aspect and came to One Health uh, via a publication by the Association American for American Association for Veterinary Medicine in 2008. And just this year, based on a meeting held in Berlin uh, entitled the One Planet, One Health and One Future Conference, we now have a new set of principles. Instead of these Manhattan principles, we now have the Berlin principles on One Health. And these are bridging global health and conservation. So I recommend if you want to check these out, that you check out this paper. It's essential reading, so please read it. What are the big topics we deal with in One Health? Resistance to antibiotics is one, which I won't be talking about today. The focus of today is talking about infectious diseases which are emerging and re-emerging. Principal mention zoonotic diseases, food safety, food security, alterations or modifications climaticas, change, way, the changes in the way we use land, and eco-health. And these things all come together. You can't separate them. You have to look at them as a whole. Now, it would be fair to say that One Health, as it is nowadays, it was reborn out of fear. The realization at the beginning of the century that we were probably going to have a big pandemic. So this wasn't just in the scientific literature. You can see here three covers of the, of the popular magazine Time, in which they're warning about bird flu uh, that we passed through the H1N1 a pandemic in 2009, but we won't always be so lucky. And a warning here that we won't be ready for the next pandemic. So they were dealing in basic on outbreaks of Ebola, West Nile fever, United States, and the original SARS, which appeared in China 2002, 2003, spread around the world, including to Canada. So the idea of One Health is a simple interaction between the three areas is unfortunately an oversimplification as shown in this excellent paper which was published in 2017, in which they developed this model for the One Health Cosmos. And looking at this model, you just see what a complex complex idea, concept, concept, complex approach One Health is. And in part, this complexity is probably one of the reasons that One Health hasn't had the full impact that it should have had in its now 17 years 
of modern existence. So it's not only me saying this, there are various publications on this. In fact, one of the things you most find in the literature are reviews of Is One Health Working? Now, this review here was published in a journal called Lancet Planetary Health, and they highlighted that there was quite a lot of duplication going on between groups working in One Health. It was difficult to see who was actually actually being engaged by these researches and the, the way that the research from One Health and its impacts is being reported is frequently ineffective. So they looked at 100 unique One Health networks and their conclusions, once again this is a paper you should really read, and their conclusions were what? That they provided empirical evidence of limitations in stakeholder representation. Who is really participating and gaining from this? that there was an absence of ambiguity in the monitoring and the evaluation of studies and structures, and there was a lot of potential for duplication between networks. And they recommended that there's a need for more collaborations led by networks within the developing world, and that there should be an increased attention to environmental health. So is that happening is the next question. And if you look at this paper, which was published in 2019, in which they compared uh, papers in uh, working in the area of environmental health and papers working in the area of infectious diseases, they made an overlap and found that only 0.5% 0, 0 of these papers dealt with the topic of One Health. So really, we're not having a lot of success bringing these areas together. What's happened more recently, since 2015, is that One Health has tried to align itself quite strongly with the United Nations Member States plans for sustainable development, these goals which are designed to bring peace and prosperity to the world by 2030. And once again, another excellent paper on this subject is this here, produced by the Network for Evaluation of One Health, a European organization. And this was published in 2017, trying to align the way One Health should develop with the uh, agenda put forward there by the United Nations. I'm trying to reach this by 2030. At that moment, we didn't know we were going to have a pandemic in the middle. So what is One Health? If we look at it from the point of view of zoonotic diseases, it's, an, it's a, a form of dealing with zoonotic diseases from a systemic, complex way of thinking. We're looking at it systematically trying to look at local implications and global implications, looking at it in different scales on different diseases. So once again, it's not really a new idea. This all existed before, but One Health as it stands now, this movement tried to bring it together. Another way of looking at One Health, which I like actually better, is this model here, which is actions which are going to bring any kind of aggregated value in terms of uh, saving human and animal lives, bringing reduced costs in terms of social services, sustainable environments, which can only be reached through cooperations, more tight cooperations between human health, animal health, and other disciplines. It doesn't distinctly say uh, environmental health. It wants us to interact with people from the area of the social sciences. It views the necessity to study culture and bring culture into the question. It looks at legal questions. It looks at economic questions. It's not limited to just those three balls that we saw in the simple CDC model. And important that we can only reach these if we, if each of these sectors were working separately, we wouldn't be able to reach these gains that we can gain and get if we work with One Health. And interestingly, this was published in a, in a microbiology journal. It's something I want you to notice as we go through this talk, where these papers are being published, yeah? And this was a mini review talking about climate change in One Health in a microbiology journal. So you see how expansive One Health is. So we could view One Health as a, as a teenager. It's got 17 years now, yeah? And and common with many teenagers, its brains are actually going through a period of development, okay? And during this period of development, we're going to have kind of trimming of the way the brain works. We're going to get rid of the excess of gray matter, and this comes through a process of learning. But at the moment still, I think it's fair to say that One Health 
really doesn't know what it's doing exactly. That's a bit of an identity crisis, which comes out of this vast range of activities that it wants to be involved in. So One Health essentially, One Health as it stands at the moment, is essentially a movement led by, by the veterinary sector. Yeah? And if you go to the Merck Veterinary Manual, which is viewed as the main place to find information in the United States on veterinary uh, sciences, they recommend or they, are, they point out these different activities in which the veterinarian is involved in public health or One Health. Yeah? Now, I put these three in red are the three which I consider most important. Diagnosis, surveillance, epidemiology, control, prevention, and elimination of zoonotic diseases. Health education and extension. This is an area where One Health has made big impacts and needs to continue making them. And government legislative activity. We have to be involved moving and changing the way that the world controls the way we deal with animal health, human health, and environmental health. So we have to be present in this political movement as well. You can't do One Health without taking politics into account. So... SARS-CoV-2 and Saudi or One Health. Here's a nice image of the, the, the coronavirus, one of millions we now have on the internet. And here's some papers which were published. In 2020, One Health trying to put its flag firmly on its role in, in the COVID, SARS-CoV-2. So once again, it's worthwhile reading these papers. And it talks about here the role of, of a SARS-CoV-2 the virus and the outbreak of it from a One Health perspective. This one here is an editorial comment and basically discusses the general role of One Health in uh, COVID-19. And here we have a, a call for veterinary leadership in One Health, which is a bit strange because vets do lead One Health, but trying to get vets to be more active in explaining trying to control or not control to influence the way we're dealing with the current pandemic and the way we're going to deal with future ones. So there was a fair amount of information in the One Health literature about this. And if we can pinpoint where One Health has actually had a role in this current pandemic, we can start looking at the question of what's the role of SARS-CoV-2 and animals, domestic, uh, domestic and production animals. Yeah, this was a fear which was raised very early on in the pandemic that the virus could spread to animals and then that would demonstrate, disseminate the virus even more so, making it even more difficult to control, even worse if it was in wild animal populations. So this was, this was looked at closely at the beginning. I'm not a veterinarian. If you want excellent information on this, I'm going to point you to two different videos. First one by Professor Helio Altran de Moraes, who gave an excellent review of this in a presentation made Phil Cruz at the end of last year. And a short but very interesting video made by Professor Clayton Gitty from our university, which tried to provide solid information for the public regarding the dangers of, or, or, or the misinformation surrounding the potential for animals to transmit uh, COVID or, or catch COVID, transmit COVID, be involved in COVID in any way or form. So we all know now, because we get this information all the time from the from the general the general media, that dogs, cats may be susceptible to it. Uh, we know the situation with the minks, which caused the culling of many of these animals, a production animal, which possibly shouldn't even be produced as, as production animals. That's a different question for a different talk. But Really, the impact of COVID or this virus, SARS-CoV-2, on animals was limited. And the role of animals in this pandemic is limited. Now, did they cause the pandemic? Let's see this a bit further down the line. But at the moment, we're pretty certain that animals are not involved in the maintenance and the, the spread of this, this virus and this pandemic we're living at the moment. So the World Health Organization for Animal Health, the OIE, they published a working guideline for, for dealing with this. Very, very good document published there at the end of 2020 as well. And there were some cases, or in fact, as far as I know from reading the literature, there's been only one case where we had transmission of the virus to a wild animal. It was another mink uh, which caught it. This mink was living in the surroundings of a mink farm 
in the United States, uh, didn't develop any disease, but was detected virus in them by PCR. Um, MIGs were also implicated here by Chinese workers who came up with this possible model for the transmission cycle and transmission chain for SARS-CoV-2. This model has not really been very well accepted by anybody, but it's an interesting read if you want to check it out. And the mink story is a very interesting One Health story. So once again, I'm not a vet. I don't want to go too far down this line with you. Involvement of animals, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I recommend, once again, this is a very recently published review on all the information we have about mink, SARS-CoV-2, and the human-animal interface. Really worthwhile reading this paper. So what is the origin of SARS-CoV-2? So One Health is obviously interested in this. We want to pinpoint the origin so we can instigate controls for it not to happen at least in the same way again. So there's this theory that SARS-CoV-2 emerged in a population of wild animals and it made the jump from those populations to us. Whether it was a direct jump from uh, the original originator animal, which is often quoted as being bats, or if, if it was via uh, intermediate host, is still a matter for debate, and lots of models have been put forward for this. So it's interesting that bats always feature in these models, they're always up here at the top. And this is because we've done a lot of work on bats, and we know that bats have a lot of coronaviruses in them. But what's interesting is that we look at these models here, and you get the impression that it was bats that transmitted MERS to camels. It was bats which transmitted the original SARS virus to uh, palm civets. It was bats, bats which are involved in Ebola. It's bats which are involved in Nipah virus. If you take them all, there really only is concrete proof for bats and Nipah. Uh, there's strong evidence for this SAD, which is another coronavirus which emerged in swine in China, but it's not 100% convincing either. But bats probably get a tough deal in this story, although they probably are the original source, but we haven't proved that yet. If you go back a little further, 2016, before SARS-CoV-2 came, people were already looking at this. And as you can see in this image, this is what I want to get home to you, that these broken lines indicate that a link here has not really been made. And that's for SMERS and SARS-CoV from bats to humans. That's from MERS from bats to camels. It's from MERS going from humans to back to camels. They put here that bats definitively passed a virus to civets, which then passed it to humans. But that data there is actually a little bit questionable still as well. So all this is coming out of molecular biology. Veterinarians are involved. Environmental scientists are involved. And obviously medics are involved. So we, it's a One Health topic. Uh, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, we had strong evidence presented or which gave this idea of a proximal origin for SARS-CoV-2. Where did it come from? And this was presented once again in the form of molecular data in which sequences from SARS-CoV-2 were compared to sequences from what we, sequences which have been collected over the last decades from bat and other animals which have uh, coronaviruses in them. We saw that the nearest relative to it, this RATG13 here, he uh, has a number of differences in his S protein, the famous spike protein, but those differences were compensated by this pangolin variant. So the idea sprung up that uh, pangolins were somehow infected by this virus here, or a virus very similar to it, which resulted in this SARS-CoV-2 virus, which we now have, although there are a number of holes in this argument as well. So this is an ongoing argument, an ongoing discussion, which was tried to be resolved by the World Health Organization and their visit to Wuhan at the end or the beginning of this year. Some of you probably saw in Fantastico here in Brazil this, this weekend, this is now being strongly debated, the information which was produced by the World Health Organization. And the World Health Organization said that major stones had been unturned. Good progress had been made in identifying the origin. They came down strongly on the idea of uh, animal origin 
transfer, uh, classical genotic disease transference from animals to humans and then dissemination throughout the human population. And they presented their evidence at the Congress on this single piece of paper, which you can see in a bit more detail. They subsequently produced a report which came down in favor of this argument. But they also stated that there was a lot of politics involved. Politics was always in the room during this. A lot of people have criticized this uh, approach by the World Health Organization, and we're currently in a, a stage of re-examining this. And it's not really something I want to go into too much, this argument about this. But what's the problem when we're trying to do this? We're trying to put together a, a, a jigsaw puzzle, a quebra cabeza, yeah? But we're missing pieces. And as it is, we take things from different jigsaw puzzles and we join them together. And what we end up with is what we call a pig jaw suzzle, which you have the jaw of a pig here, but you have lots of bits from other animals. And this isn't conclusive. We can't really base our, our, our definitions on anything based on this kind of information. We're left for this kind of decision here. Who is to blame? The left aspects are all lined up in this virus. We just have environmental scientists. They've been involved in, in the One Health aspects of COVID as well. And this is a nice site, the site from the University of Maine, United States, their One Health program, which they point out very effectively what are the areas in which environmental scientists are involved in One Health. And One Health scientists, environmental scientists involved in One Health got involved early on in the pandemic to look at this question here, water, sanitation, hygiene, and waste management. Why? Because the ideas came up, we can find virus in feces. So if we're finding virus in feces, if we're brushing our teeth and spitting our dirty water down the sink, these viruses are finding their way into the wastewater treatment system. Yeah. So. There was a concern early on that possibly this could be leading to dissemination of the virus, so this had to be looked into. And once again, pay attention to where these papers are being published. You'll see that it's basically environmental researchers <coughs> working on this. So we had a close off now in February of 2021, a nice paper by Brazilian and Portuguese scientists, which gave a critical review on it and basically said, we still don't know where we are with that. But the result of all this work was that it was clearly established that viral RNA is stable in sewage. And that you can use the detection of that viral RNA as a surrogate method for monitoring the distribution, the presence of this virus, the circulation of it in a given geographical area. So you can see here that even at 37 degrees C, you're not going to have a big fall in viral loads over two or three days. And if you maintain your sewage at four degrees C, you can hold it for up to 35 days and still maintain very high levels of viral RNA in your samples, allowing you to detect it. So this was the rethink in the way that we use uh, wastewater risks and the monitoring of wastewater based on this COVID-19 pandemic that we're living. And essentially the model is shown to you here, how do you do it, we measure it. Uh, using the same techniques, detection techniques, which are used uh, to detect material from clinical samples. And we're effectively employing a uh, wastewater epidemiology. So 80% of the individuals who contract COVID or SARS-CoV-2 are asymptomatic and possibly pass under the radar. And this is particularly the case when you have lower levels of infection in a given uh, location. So monitoring SARS-CoV-2 in residual waters is ideal to describe these spatial temporal tendencies in the incidence of this, this disease. Yeah? A, and this can serve as a system for early warning for the implementation on mitigation of solutions for public health problems, essentially SARS-CoV-2. So there are a number of opportunities for, for One Health in this area. And it's clear from the work that's been done that One Health has an important role to play here, it has been playing, and that most of this work, unfortunately, is still being done principally by vet and, uh, by environmental, the environmental science component of One Health. It's not really being done in collaboration with the 
people from the human health aspect of One Health. There's been a little bit of a barrier, and it's very well discussed in all these papers we're looking at, but it's a nice option. It's an option that's been taken by a number of countries where they don't have huge outbreaks still of SARS-CoV-2. And this is an excellent site I recommend you visit. It's called COVID Poops. And on this, they're monitoring all the places which are registering and using this method for monitoring of monitoring of SARS-CoV-2. You can see that the study has been put in place by some groups here. This method is in place by some groups here in Brazil, including here in Rio de Janeiro. Theo Cruz were involved in a quite a, quite a big study using this in Niteroi. And they published a good paper now which showed that during the first wave of uh, COVID, which we had in the country, this method in Niteroi was used as a to give support to both public health policies at this municipal level in Brazil. Niteroi, the local government of Niteroi, took the information from this kind of monitoring and used it to implement control measures. Very, very good. Excellent One Health. Another advantage of this method as well is that you can detect different variants which are circulating using next generation sequencing to examine the material which you've detected in sewage. And that's another, if you're detecting those variants earlier, it's another form of advising. We have to implement stronger control measures here. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of this method. It's something I think we should be implementing a lot more here in Brazil, but it's not me that decides that. So the environmental scientists were involved again in this question here. It's this question of can we be transmitting this disease back to animals? So we're coming back to this question again. We're talking about zooanthropoenosis or zoonosis in reverse, in which humans which are infected subsequently pass the disease back to animals. In this case, the focus principally on wildlife. Logo at the start, right at the start of this, American science scientists, once again, look what they're publishing, they're not publishing in health journals, they're publishing in environmental journals, published this model for potential spillover from SARS-CoV-2 into wild hosts. And this was a model put forward for the United States, which essentially they viewed environmental contamination by contaminated wastewater, transmitting the virus to wildlife, which in turn could spread it back to humans and aggravate even more this uh, terrible pandemic we're living in. So we had studies based on, these were studies, purely model studies, and we had these studies which then showed that a number of wild animals would be susceptible, predicted wild and domesticated animals would be predictable, were predicted to be sensitive to infection by SARS-CoV-2 based on analysis of this receptor, the receptor which is used by the virus to invade our cells, which are used to invade the cells of the uh, the original host that was in, and which it could use to invade cells of these animals, causing disease in them. So that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, a very prestigious journal. Then we had another one published here in this Perspectives in Ecology and Conservation, in which they put forward uh, uh, a question of the risks to a broad range of animals. And subsequently, we even had studies indicating that we could be infecting aquatic animals. This was published once again, Science of the Total Environment, Pandemic Dangers to the Deep. This was published by American scientists and Canadian scientists. And they predicted that the release of contaminated wastewater into aquatic environments could be infecting these, uh, these animals there. This was once again all based on analysis of similarities between human uh, uh, between the receptor binding domain of the virus and the amino acid sequences of the ACE2 receptors, which these mammalian species have. And they were able to point this and combine their data into suscept relative susceptibility to the virus and status of endangerment. So this had a big impact, this paper, when it came out, raised a lot of questions. One of the interesting things was that this organism here, this Amazon river dolphin, he's critically endangered and he's one of the most most seriously or most the most likely to be affected by the virus in terms of susceptibility between his receptor and the virus binding domain. And uh, it's also in an area where we had one of the worst outbreaks 
of SARS-CoV-2 in the country. But this was contested by various people, and it's important that we have this scientific debate has to be built on on this and later this year in 2021 a number of people came out and have basically stated that there's no risk to wildlife by the release of a virus from us into sewage either treated or untreated that subsequently finds its way into the environment but we have to remember that we're living in pandemic times and that evidence of absence or absence of evidence the school excuse me is not necessarily evidence of absence so the jury is still out on what's possibly happening to wildlife. Another area where we got involved here is vaccination of animals. This is a strong component of the World Health model, using vaccination as a model to control zoonotic diseases. It's not really put much into practice, but there's a lot of theory on it. And we saw this week that Russia has already developed a vaccine. It's an inactivated vaccine, and they're already starting to vaccinate animals, principally cats and dogs. The USA have also vaccinated, they actually vaccinated before, they vaccinated great apes at San Diego Zoo, where there was an outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 amongst those animals. And an interesting point here is if we make a comparison here, what do these two uh, primates have in common? They both had COVID, they've both been vaccinated, and they both received treatment with synthetic antibodies as part of the way to deal with their infection in COVID. So, very interesting. So we can't really talk about One Health without talking about geopolitics, so we'll have to go there briefly. The COVID pandemic is a challenge for uh, public politics globally. Yeah. Now, there's not many differences between the viruses. We have the variants which have popped up, but if we assume that we're dealing with a single virus, there's not much difference between the virus that's here and the virus that's on the other side of the planet. But we do see that the impact of the pandemic varied considerably from country to country, which expo exposed a lot of uh, disequilibrations, a lot of uh, uh, injustice and vulnerabilities in terms of the way that we dealt with this, the way that the, the public health worked to deal with this. Yeah? Also, political systems and economic systems were involved in this at national and international levels. And there was a, this big difference between the levels of mortality per infection and the way in which different nations were able to gerenciar or manage this, this outbreak in their countries. Clearly point to what? That socioeconomics and geopolitical factors have a very large impact, as much as big an impact on the progress of the, pan, of the pandemic as the viral characteristics of SARS-CoV-2. Yeah? And this is something we really have to bear in mind. So if you want more information on this, this is a nice paper to read. And let's see if One Help can get a bit more involved in this global game of chess and try to reduce this unhealthy geopolitics which we're living at the moment. So forgetting One Health for a minute, if we look at how different places have dealt with this virus, we can't ignore the fact that in China, they went from this situation in February to this century, this uh, 2020 to this situation in August of 2020. The numbers speak very loudly here. How is, how is this possible? How is it that China was able to keep its numbers of cases below 100, while the United Kingdom, Brazil, United States, countries which have long histories of good public health science, countries which strongly support the One Health a approach to doing science failed to do so. Even worse, so when we look at mortalities, China only had 4,600 mortalities in comparison to nearly 600,000 in the United States. So something's wrong with the way we're working on health. Or is it? Or is it simply because the China was able to implement draconian uh, methods which wouldn't work in any of these three countries. And this is something we're going to have to discuss a lot, this entire question of the constitution of liberty and at which point our individual liberties impact upon our ability to protect society as a whole. So it's a, it's a tough question that's going to have to be discussed. So where's the next pandemic coming from? So we looked at what, what One Health is, what One Health was doing. Let's see if we can try and see what's happening with the next pandemic. 
So we're going to need a crystal ball to really see this, or maybe not. And if we do need a crystal ball, it's probably going to be an even bigger crystal ball than that one there. Are we going to be ready for the next pandemic? And this is a lovely image. It's the reason I put it here, this microbiological image here at the side. But are we ready for the next pandemic? Now, if we go back to the beginning of the century, all the information we needed not to have this pandemic at the moment was available. It just wasn't being acted on. And this is an essential paper for anyone interested in One Health to read. It's talking about the emerging infectious diseases of wildlife, threats to biodiversity and human health. And this figure sh clearly, clearly shows you all the interactions which are involved, which lead to the generation of pandemics. But the lessons weren't learned. Now, what's being touted or put forward by many people is the idea of using viral genomics. It's being put forward as this, if we can study all the viruses on the planet, we'll be able to understand them better and we'll be able to deal with them better. So we have this project here, the Global Virome Project, which has these very ambitious goals, which wants to build capacity globally in this field, wants to discover over half a million viruses, and wants to use that information to produce solutions to uh, the emergence of pandemics. Very noble idea. This is a nice paper which was produced by this organization in conjunction with the uh, Chinese scientists, which examined uh, the presence of viruses in wildlife rodents, small mammals, including bats. They examined more than uh, 3,000 animals. They got more than 30,000 viruses back. They sequenced them. They have all our information. What are they going to do with it? That's the next big question. And this is a very interesting paper here. But what I really want to draw to your attention here is who was it that published this paper? Google org published this paper. And that's why I've given you this important reading. We really need to bring in these uh, monsters of the social networks, of the, the whole computational internet world to help us deal with pandemics. This is obvious now. It's a component which was maybe even missing in a huge model of the One Health Cosmos. How do pandemics happen? Well, this is the idea we get from that film Contagion, yeah? The, Bats here are being ousted out of their usual habitat because the trees which you live in are being knocked down for agriculture. The bat has to move to another place. It's eating a banana here. This banana tree was close by a pig production area. The bat moves there, drops the banana infected with its saliva containing virus, which is then eaten by a pig. The pigs all live together happily for a few days, transmitting the virus between themselves. Somebody comes to buy the pig, it's a chef, takes it back to his restaurant, he's handling it there, he's putting his fingers in its mouth. He doesn't follow good hygiene practice in the kitchen, he cleans his hands on his, on, his prop, on his own clothes. Then he goes to meet a client who wants to congratulate him on the meal. They shake hands, continue to shake hands, and this is now day one. This woman will subsequently return to the United States and you'll have the dissemination of this pandemic. So it doesn't necessarily happen that way. Really, it doesn't really happen that way. Pandemics don't tend to happen so rapidly. Viruses don't evolve and jump between species with such ease. Yeah, There's a lot of ongoing challenge, a lot of viruses trying to find its way from one organism into another, expand its host range. They generally fail. But occasionally they do get through, and then you'll maybe get some low-level human infections. And there may be some mutations or differences in that virus there. It can go back into the wildlife pod and come back again. And as you can see here, this takes years before we get to the stage where we have efficient human-to-human -human transmission, and then we have an outbreak. Yeah, So it's not as easy as pig meets, pig, pig meets bat who is consumed by humans and then you transmit the virus. It's not as easy as that. And this is clearly demonstrated by the fact that we still haven't definitively found the origin of the original SARS outbreak from 2002 in China. In China. And this is an excellent paper here, which was published in 2017, which showed that once again, it, they didn't find any individual 
SARS-related coronavirus, which was able to match with the virus which is found in humans, but the population of viruses which were there had the necessary components that if you took bits of them and joined them together, and this occurs through a combination within, with the coronaviruses, that you could make a SARS-CoV-2 virus. Yeah, or sorry, excuse me, a SARS-1-CoV-1 virus. But it's taken 15 years for scientists to do this, and they studied this cave for five years. So it's not easy for us to get this information this way. So there's this, Im this image that the world or the wild world is, 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 is wild, yeah? And we have to change this a little bit, I think. One Health has an important role to play here. As suggested by Richard Osfeld, who's an a, 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 a excellent ecologist, he said that the best way for us to prevent genetic diseases is to restrict our research to local places where humans most impact natural environments. And there's a generalized mistake in thinking that the wildlife are somehow some kind of dangerous pot of infectious agents that are just waiting to jump onto, jump onto us humans. Yeah? Once again, that's a very uh, egocentric view that we have as the owners of the planet. Yeah? And we have lots of this idea being reinforced by popular culture, this idea of microbial threats in wildlife and out there in the wild. And this has to be reverted, yeah? Because a myoria or the biggest threats, genetic threats, are going to come from where? Natural areas which have been converted into plantations, pastages or, or areas for creating a, a production animals, and urban areas where the uncontrolled urbanization has put humans once again in contact with wildlife. So this is an excellent paper published just last month. I recommend you all have a look at it. These guys come up with a different way of looking at how we're going to implement One Health to deal with future uh, respiratory virus pandemics. It's well worth a read. And they come up with this idea that this idea that studying wildlife populations just apart and sequencing everything isn't really going to bring us any closer to being able to predict what the actual problems are going to be. Nor is the idea of focusing upon pathogens which are already known. We've got good information there. We know that influenza is probably the next big risk. So we have to keep an eye on that ball. We can't let it go. But perhaps we should be dealing more with really focusing on where these interactions are happening. And that's where we should be sampling and doing these kind of studies. Yeah. This letter in Chinese here says close but not the same. And this has taken us back to 2012 when there was three cases of a fatal pneumonia in miners in a bat-infested copper mine in China, okay? Now they tested, serologically tested uh, for the presence of Ebola, NIFA, and the original SARS virus, and they didn't find any. They then conducted a study between 2012 to 2015 frequently sampling the bats and looking for coronaviruses and bat feces. And they found this one here. We saw him already in that image I showed you. We found the RATG13, which is viewed to be the closest relative to SARS-CoV-2 in that uh, population of bats. They tested serum that they collected at that time again in 2020 against SARS-CoV-2, and the results were still negative. And we're back to our jigsaw puzzles again. Freezers in these laboratories which do this kind of work, they have many hundreds or even thousands of samples of feces and saliva. You can't fully sequence them because in many cases it's impractical, the quantity of the, the, the RNA isn't sufficient for you to get full sequences, and most of them don't grow in cell culture. So they're stored as frozen samples, and usually they're characterized by sequencing a single gene which lets you class them into the different possible groups of coronaviruses. So the RATG13 virus was completely sequenced and was more or less forgotten. It was just there in a data bank until the 2020 SARS, 2019 SARS-CoV-2 SARS -CoV pandemic started, and they compared its sequence with the sequence of SARS-CoV-2, which was produced in a matter of weeks, two weeks, to generate the sequence of this virus, and they found that it shared 91.6% percent nucleotide similarity, which looks like a lot, but 
coronavirus is mutated slowly. So a 4% disagreement in the 30,000 bases that you have in the genomes of these viruses means that those two viruses probably diverged maybe 40 years ago. So it's a close relative, but divergence was a long time ago. So once again, close, but not the same. And we're back to our pig jaw sizzle once again. So who are we going to test? What are we going to test? Should we be testing in these areas here, small producers, which live in close harmony with their animals? Should we be testing people who transport animals? Should we be testing this guy here? Should we be testing the people who unload these chickens in the markets where they're going to? People who load them onto trucks? Should we be checking people in animal production facilities? This one here in the USA, you're seeing these guys don't have masks on. They're protecting the chickens against them wearing gloves and these hats, but they themselves are exposed to anything that's in those animals. And this situation here, who are we going to test in this chicken factory here, processing plant here, which is a Chinese chicken processing plant? So it's an idea that's been put forward by various people. We need to make a closer collaboration with Big Agro. Yeah? Big Agro is highly modernized. They have fantastic data for monitoring where they are, what they're doing, where they're going, what their plans are. This is all heavily documented. And as appointed here in this other excellent paper, which was put forward by the, the, uh, the USDA in the States, we really need to win animal agriculture's stronger collaboration. But there's immense distrust on both sides between One Health scientists and the people who are involved in big agriculture. Essentially, both of them will view this as making a deal with the devil. But it's, an, it's essential. It's something that has to happen if we're going to manage to really implement one determining which are the areas where we should be doing our sampling. So the One Health platform, which is one of the organizations involved in One Health, put forward this idea here. Let's make science involved into a One Health approach to improve health and security. This paper was published. It's an excellent idea, but it really falls short on environmental aspect. So could we learn with Africa? Africa is a place where One Health is being strongly embraced. Yeah, And uh, we can see that the way they work is integration at the local level between groups and a strong focus on capacity building. So if we look at China as well, what can we see? COVID-19, One Health have had positive effects. Why? Because uh, this document here written in Chinese is actually a document in which they've banned the consumption of wildlife in China. So not all wildlife, but a large part of it is no longer industrialized as it was prior to the beginning of this pandemic. And in this way, we may be able to avoid this kind of scenario where we have wildlife stuck up here, infecting other foods here, infecting these raw foods here below, infecting the environment, secretions dripping into this bottle, onto this guy's boots, which can then take home to his house. So we need to improve diagnostics. This is something we learned as well. And we have this principle here, caveat. It has to be cost effective. It has to be accessible. It has to be validated, but that's difficult because it can only be validated once the, the disease emerges. It has to be easy to use with minimal equipment. It has to be adaptable. We can change it as the viruses change, for instance, and it has to be transferable. And I think we saw from the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic that science responded very well and very quickly in this area. And the progress goes on. We're now looking, a caveat is what? It's a warning, an example about the use or effectiveness of something, which is why I use this term, the caveat principle for diagnosis. We now see that this technology here, CRISPR, is emerging as a new means for us to do uh, effective diagnostics. It's cheap, it's fast, and it's highly adaptable. And it doesn't require specialized equipment. Big advantage. We actually have kits available for it, but at the moment, the last time I checked on the site, only available in the US. But 
this pandemic has really stimulated the biotechnology industry to step up and produce novel, viable, effective tests, which will be more effective in the next pandemic. We need to provide evidence that it's working. Now, I'm getting towards the end of the presentation. So what do we have to do? We have to give evidence which validated evidence which demonstrate this aggregated effect of One Health, which was mentioned in that definition of One Health I gave you earlier. Yeah? The effects have to be socioeconomic effects, and that we can use this evidence to convince and inform political decisions. Otherwise, One Health is not going to work. These practices, the, the things of One Health that have worked at regional and global levels that demonstrated using One Health at critical intervention points and generating a good cost-to-benefit ratio are viable, they are what we need to demonstrate. And we have to demonstrate that the total, the total cargo, the total uh, impact of zoon, emerging zoonoses on society is so important that we have to invest in One Health. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. But we haven't managed to generate that information just yet as a movement, as a One Health movement. So which road are we going to follow? And these are essentially the last slides here. We have to go for either pandemic preparedness in which we do what? We assume there will be another pandemic, and it will probably be a respiratory virus. We have to maintain and develop, develop and maintain infrastructure and healthcare, research and development, set up laboratories, vaccine production facilities that allow us to respond rapidly and effectively to this new disease that's emerged. We have to have scientific tools, flexible diagnostics, surveillance tools to check humans, animals, and the environment. We have to monitor and control the spread of this new pathogen. And all of this is based on science. But we also have to develop and stockpile pharmaceutical measures broad spectrum antiviral therapies for early and advanced stage therapies. And we have to invest in prophylaxis with panviral vaccines, vaccines which protect against not only one disease, but a number of related diseases. We have to develop legislation to permit and, and allow prolonged, if necessary, implementation of lockdown methods, the type which were used in China so successfully, control of our borders, but we also have to elaborate economic models and establish financial reservoirs that allow us to minimize the impact of these restrictive responses. And we have to invest in education at all levels so that we view that pandemics are here to stay and that when they come, we know what our role should be and that this fear-based philosophy should be taken out of the equation and we build a society based upon collective responsibility. The other model we can follow is pandemic prevention, where there's a high probability of another pandemic, and it will probably be a respiratory virus. It will probably originate in wildlife, but it might reach humans via the food chain of production animals. And that countries have to develop and maintain infrastructure to monitor the emergence of pathogens with pandemic potential. We have to invest in targeted surveillance and pathogen characterization, molecular biology, and serological testing. We have to invest in research and development with a focus on the human-animal environment interface, One Health. We have to develop novel economic models to permit sustainable land use and urbanization. This is the idea of planetary health. We have to work to identify the forces behind zoonotic diseases and implement strategies which will minimize their influence. That's eco-health. And once again, invest in education at all levels. Once again, pandemics are here to stay, but we educate that we can largely prevent them once again by building a society based on collective responsibility. So how much is it going to cost and who is going to pay? I don't have the answer for that, so it's a very short slide. Things are beginning to move. We have a, a call by the World Health Organization to unite global leaders in an urgent call for an international pandemic treatment treaty, excuse me, to put this in plan into action. The European Union, straight on board, said they're going to participate. But unfortunately, not everybody's happy. Some people are not very keen on the uh, plans which the European Union are putting forward. And amongst them are United States, Brazil, and Russia. So 
All of this is ongoing. All of this is happening. We're seeing the geopolitics again is probably the real problem we're dealing with. So coming back to William Ostner, what did he say? He said that the extraordinary development of modern science may be her undoing. Specialism, now a necessity, has fragmented the specialities themselves in a way that makes the outlook hazardous and that the workers lose all sense of proportion in a maze of minutiae. Okay? So we can't be so specialized. We have to work together. We have to apply one health philosophy. How we can do it, it's going to be difficult, but we have to do it. So, can we prevent the next pandemic through the one health? I'd like to point out that hope isn't the last thing that dies, because hope is eternal for who really wants to win. And we really want to win as a race, so we will. So I'd like to invite anyone who's interested and wants more information, please participate in this discipline, which we offer in our postgraduate course. You don't have to be from our postgraduate course to participate in it. Here's my contact details and, sorry, thank you very much. <laughs>